Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Kaiser. And for today's episode, I have on with me two very special guests. Today, we're going to tell the story of South Florida garage punk band, one of my personal favorites, Morbid Opera. I have on with me Libby Bentley and Carbon Monoxide. Hey there, welcome in. How are you both? Hey, Hi, great. Good. Thank you. It's good to have you both on here. We have a lot to get to. This has been uh, one of my most excited, most anticipated episodes because Morbid Opera is a band that uh, I do really love. And I'm looking forward to hearing the story as well as sharing it with all the listeners out there. Because I imagine there's a lot of stories and things that have happened over the years that many people may not know. So this will be very exciting. So you ready to get going? Yes, we are. All right, let's do it. So I want to kind of travel back a little bit, way back to the early years, uh, kind of where you grew up. So Libby, if you want to kind of start us off, can you tell us kind of where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. I was born in um, Fort Lauderdale, grew up in Plantation, um, had a house in Wilton Manors. Yeah. And I, and I moved, but we'll we'll stick in Florida. All right. And Carmen, what about you? I was born here in Miami in 1964. Um, uh, Cuban family, first generation, single mother, moved around a lot every like six months. And basically in the Miami area, Westchester, um, and um, like Village Green, the Kendall area, Atapala, Atapala, and Miami River section. And I did move once to which is where the music came into uh, Fort Lo um, Cooper City, which is now known as Southwest Ranches. And in that area was the Hollywood Sportatorium. When the Hollywood Sportatorium, which is now defunct, was the biggest you know, place to go see bands and whatever, like the big things like Foghat, Ted Nugent, and all that kind of crap. And I actually went there. I liked music when I saw Heart for the first time in the Sportatorium. Nice. When I saw that, before all that, I saw like, you know, Boston, Foghead, all those bands. It was incredible to see women playing and just fell into that, that, oh my God, women can do it and women can do it better. Thanks, Carmen. <laughs> and, and Libby, what about you? What were your earliest memories of getting into music and maybe one of your first concerts you went to? Oh, 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 um, oh my God, I'm so old. I think my first concert was like Electric Light Orchestra. Nice. I yeah, mean, ELO. Was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think Fleetwood Mac, but it was horrible. I didn't like any of that. Oh, I love Fleetwood Mac. Did your parents influence you when you were growing up or did you have siblings or friends that were close in your circle that may have been helping you kind of get into some other music? Um, no, I was an artist and um, no, my parents were really cool. And really my first exposure was the New Wave Lounge and it became a second family. It was, yeah. It was like all the misfits, and I loved it. And that was uh, in Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, it was right on the beach, and it was people would come from Miami, like Carmen. You went to, yeah, you went to the New Wave Lounge, right? Of course, I got arrested. I went to jail with Lisa the singer. I was a juvenile. What did you do, Carmen? Well, one thing with Morbid Opera was me and and Lisa would hang out, which is the lead singer of Morbid Opera. We always seemed to get into bar fights. And I was a minor, which I tried to tell Libby, I'm a minor. I don't know how old Libby is right now, and I can't really differ. I have to like actually go to the calculator to remember. I, I was like but the I was, prude of the group. Yeah, I was 15, 16. And at that time in Florida, uh, drinking age in the bars was 18. Well, I was a minor. Uh, and I remember going to the New Wave Lounge, and, and we always used to get into fight with other women. Women always used to fight us. I don't know. They always were jealous or something, or like, because, you know, whatever, we were like promiscuous or whatever. 
And uh, I remember the cops came to break it up, and it was like whatever. I went to jail. I was a juvenile, and I went to I went to juvenile detention. I had a fake ID. I was a minor, and my mom refused to go get me. I do have a sister. She's a year and, a, and my sister, who was still a juvenile as well, was the one who they she called since my mom refused to go get me out of jail, <laughs> ju juvie, being arrested at fucking the New Wave Lounge. My sister went and got me, even though she was also a minor, but they did release me because they realized that, you know, I was what, having a fake ID in a bar. Uh, being 15, I was already getting into the bars. The bars were 18 at that time. Thank God. I mean, I'm glad they raised it. But yeah, because, you know, the bars at that time, they let every all the girls in. You know right. what I mean? Didn't matter if you were 14 or 15. How did you two meet? Well, that's a long story. Um, I did not necessarily, what are you saying, Libby? I did not necessarily meet Libby. Um, I kind of met Lisa, the lead singer, and my sister, for whatever fucking reason, one day bought me a drum set. Is this orange flaky drum set? I just looked at it and I'm like, whatever. And anyways, I have never had like a musical class, you know, how to play drums or how to play anything. I got this drum set. And beat away on it in my fucking bedroom, listening to the Ramones, which other people turned me on to with time. And somehow then I ended up meeting Lisa through KT Green and Allison Schnackenberg. I actually met Lisa once in a in a bathroom at the Agora Ballroom. You know, and I was like with that, I was 15, you know, a little punky thing with, you know, being like trying to be new wave. And there was these hardcore girls <laughs> there. And they just blew me up. So that went on and um, basically everybody in the music scene at that time would call me up, all guys, to come jam with them because I was the only person who actually had a drum set and a car. So I would jam with guys and playing Jimi Hendrix and whatever and I just played, 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 played. I didn't know what I was playing. Chris Cotty from the E was the one who taught me my basic thing of one, two, three, and four. He goes, this is a basic rock beat. This is what you do. You get the biggest drum, which I do have to this day, and I have it there, which I got from Joy Meyer from the reactions when he played with the Battalion Saints. And my drums are, you know, 24 inch, 18 inch tom, like the biggest, biggest that you can get. And he always told me, just hit as hard as you can. <laughs> I really love Chris Cotty. That guy was a sweetheart from the eat. Right. Um, hit the rim and the skin as hard as you can because you know at that time these clubs they don't have mics for the drums and that and that was it like beat the shit out of the fucking drum and then they since i was the only person that had a drum set that had a car and i was 16 years old <laughs> they asked me i try out and i did and in the interview that i was reading the interview that we did that's in our record um then i was fucking drunk and i said they didn't take me because that was too fast uh libby what about you in terms of perhaps your early beginnings in music i believe you're more of a bass player but perhaps you play other instruments as well <laughs> And uh, what are your what are your recollections of also getting a chance to meet the people who? Um, the I think I got a bass at a garage sale, and it was I'm I'm really influenced by like the slits and the raincoats, and Charlie Pickett always said the best bands never play out. Like if you practice to perfection, you never play out. So it was like fuck it, and um, yeah, I had a a tape recorder and I would do, I think I would bring it to practice and play, well, two tape recorders. So you do like a two track almost. Um, yeah, it was kind of, and, and I'm so ADD. I never learned to read music or anything. So it was kind of like, okay, I thought of something in my head. Can you come up with something to match it? And Carmen, when um, she joined, we had a drummer before, which he's still on Facebook. I've talked to him. But, um, well, Lisa kicked him out, and she met Carmen, and we kind of wanted all girls, which I can't remember if we were all girls at that point. But um, it didn't matter if she could play. It was all about 
sloppy was great sloppy was great and it didn't matter if you were perfect did she have the attitude you were looking for oh yeah she's a firecracker if you you could tell i had the drum set damn it i could huh? show up <laughs> i was hired yeah, because but... i had a drum set and was willing to show up let's just cut it to the chase well and i that's think why only anybody played with me because well, not because I knew how to play, but because because at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of drummers. Most of the drummers were all in the big bands, like the Reactions, or you know. And so I laughed because actually, in the interview that I read that we had done in Sub Labs, it said it. Oh, they hired me because I had a drum set. Because the first time I tried out, they didn't because it was too fast or too. Oh, drunk. with us? But yeah, it's right there. Nelson said it. And a second time, they kind of called me up. I was actually practicing with Debbie Page, which is known as Rage, in the scene, and wanted to create a hardcore band of females called Archaic Conflict. And we were trying out girls and that, and whatever. And then they called me up. Oh, hey, can you come back? We will have this gig with the E. I mean, the, playing with the E. Mind you, I already knew the E. You know, the E taught me how to play drums. This is like the, the show of the lifetime. I'm like, holy hell, yeah, I'm there. And that's how we joined. Now, um, what I loved about Morbid Opera, me, and with the girls, and it wasn't a girl band to me because we had Nelson. He was the boy. And, and Libby, when she asked me to do this podcast, I was like, well, Libby, I honestly can't remember shit. I don't even remember how we wrote a song. I'm mean, I was 16 at the time. They were the, the adults. I don't know if she was an adult. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, she, you know, like, how do we write a music? Because as I got older, I played more and whatever. And Libby, the band was Libby and Lisa. They, Libby started the band. And she is the one who had the lyrics and had the art part of it. She was the more, which was great. And uh, as far as like they were like one time we were gonna play a club that I I remember it to like yesterday and they wanted to play like a film looped with like porn or something you know behind us all the special effects was Libby she was the visual and the lyrics were Libby and Lisa. Um, how, did the, how did the name come about? Where did Morbid Opera come from? That was it was <clears throat> a painting of my friend Kevin McGill and I think he. It was called Morbid Opera, like on the bottom. And I'm like, yeah, that's a cool name. Yeah, it didn't matter if you can like, if you have a beat, whatever. I mean, it went, the first round was Chewy, our drummer who couldn't play. And I think because Lisa got sick, we sick of, we had to um, cart Chewy around. He didn't have a car and she fired him because I'm like a big chicken. And she's like, Carmen, I'm like, I don't care. You know, if you can, if you have the nerve to get on the drums, cool. And, um, yeah. And we had Nelson eventually. That was, he was like really straight. Um, and, and then we had Kathy on guitar and they quit right before we had a show in Gainesville and Jeff Hodap lived in Gainesville. <clears throat> and they quit kind of spike quit and so i was like charlie um do you think you could fill in and he did and i was like wow we have charlie pickett and we played um in gainesville and then the second guitar we got elizabeth who um carmen knew and she was really yeah. cool yeah she yeah. was so 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 with the band in my personal experience they were like more like uh avant-garde the band was more avant-garde artistic and really like you know whatever flowed flowed <laughs> when i was eight or ten i was a last key kid and lived in my mom's car basically the one song that really influenced me i was hard bent on it and that must be where i came into my drumming now after that i didn't my sister bought me a drum that I never fucking wanted was Deep Purple Highway Star. Do you have any idea of that? It's like really fast. Well, that's how I played. The faster, the better. The faster, the better. You know what I mean? 
Right. <laughs> so they were like more mellow and artistic and, you know, it, and it was an avant-garde and punk and, and basically and, you could keep a beat Carmen and it was fast and they would follow me. They didn't care. <laughs> it was but yeah, I was would great. bring in, I would bring in, um, I think I would record things like that came into my head and, um, whoever the guitar player, you know, can you play along with this? And I sucked on bass, but I would come up with riffs. So it was never about, um, about being yeah, well, all, all the music writing, like I said, was Libby and Lisa. Lisa and Libby and Lisa were really the band. Like I was just there. You know what I mean? I was just there. I was just borrowed and it, but it was great. I, I loved it because like I spoke in my interview, we would, you know, jam. And to me, it was always a jam because that's what I, I learned jamming. And yeah. I at that point in my life, I didn't know about, okay, there's a chorus and the verse and there's the this and the fucking hook and the, the whatever. And you have to write it. Okay. That the structure, didn't get, I, the structure I was, of the song. I was 16 years old. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where did you all practice? And it was a jam. Remember? You remember where you yeah, all practiced? Yeah, we did in the garage. Or Nelson's garage. Do you remember where we practiced? And yeah, Nelson's garage and over where everybody practiced, which I think was where, I don't know if it was Electric Criteria Studio or something on 71st Street. It in was um, where um, Rap Bastard was. And at first, do you know who Rap Bastard is? Of course. Yeah. So anyhow, they used to make fun of us. And now he's like, you know, like the, the cool shit and they... But yeah, we'd hear snide remarks. And why do you, why do you think why do you think those remarks came your way? Because we were like sloppy and weird, and now he's sloppy and weird. No offense, but it was I can't remember. We were in Fort Lisa and I were in Fort Lauderdale, and we would drive to the studio. I can't remember what it's what? called. It wasn't, was it sync? Like a freestanding building. Oh, that's where everybody practiced or recorded. Yeah. If that, that was the studio we went to. Eat. Yeah. The Eat and um, just about everybody else. I believe the Eat did. I know Charlie Pickett practiced there. Um, yeah, it was so a We practiced place. a lot in Nelson's garage till he quit the band. Yeah, in his mom's garage. Did Nelson and, ever? Uh, did, know, he, did Nelson ever do anything else besides Morbid Opera? Nah, not no. that I know. Of. I never kept in touch with them. He was married. He was a young kid married. I can't remember how he found Nelson. But I, but, I don't know. Um, Nelson was before me. He joined two months before me. But anyways, better yet, I met this really hot looking chick, and she's like, "Oh," and I'm like, "Oh, I play guitar." And she's like, "Oh, I can play guitar." Whatever. She was like me. We only knew so much. And I put her in the band. So they, Morbid Opera filled Nelson with Charlie Pickett from the X, right? Which was doing like the rhythm and the leads. And then I brought this other girl named Elizabeth Brooklyn, bombshell. And, yeah, um, gorgeous. and then she was doing like rhythm. And cause you know, I met her I'm like, Hey, hook up, you know, and then we had a gig and I remember that was the day we had a gig and I don't remember exactly. And he's like, Oh, I'm not coming. And Elizabeth's just like freaked the fuck out. Oh my God. And like, and he told her you can do it. And that was it. And then Elizabeth became the guitarist. And, um, what was fun about Elizabeth, uh, she, she passed away. Elizabeth and I ended up, I ended up bringing Elizabeth with me to New York and became my guitar player, whatever she fell into bad drug use but elizabeth is passed away uh but of course elizabeth was a beautiful blonde show girl wore really risky clothes they didn't match anything with more of an opera but she sure. played yeah. good beautiful. she she banged all the guys but she would only bang the guitar players and they would complain to me oh she steals my riffs because you know we play by ear not that we're but so she would date the guy that played the guitar for whatever crucial truths <laughs> the whole thing was Nelson and our other guitar players, player, um, we had done a warehouse show and I forget who it was, but Lisa and somebody else got really drunk and they were pushing Lisa in a shopping cart and Nelson and our guitar player got fed up, but Charlie Pickett saved us. And 
uh, he, oh, yeah. you know, of course he, he's an actual guitar player and Elizabeth, it was enough to fill in and it just like saved our asses. And I was so grateful and surprised Charlie, you know, filled in for us. And it was great. It was this huge house in Tallahassee, kind of like a mansion. Well, yeah, an old mansion. Like it was like three stories and uh, in the, um, the attic they had a church of bob and i'm like oh, yes, remember, that? remember that yes we did do some gigs besides doing a lot of gigs in miami and day county and broward county we did go to tallahassee which i i i remember basically you know it was like a frat house it was a wood frat yeah, house Gain Gainesville, and right? then i i remember also going to and i don't and i think i remember going with charlie pickett but i don't remember much about it i remember going to tampa and Ebor City. I know as a tourist, yeah. but I remember going there. I don't know if we played there, but yeah. So that was our big thing. We did do a show in Gainesville, which I know Jeff was there from Roach Motel. That's when Lisa met her husband. And then before that, we had done a show in Tallahassee. If Florida is, what really sucks is Florida, you have to drive from Miami. I don't know, what, six, eight hours to get to Tallahassee and Gainesville? Might be and a so you that. Really have a lot of bands. Yeah, yeah. And like and and thinking about it, I mean, I've traveled now Europe and that, and oh my god, in an hour I'm in Italy, in an hour I'm in fucking France. And I was like, Oh my god, Florida, what bands really would really want to come all the way down? You you would rather do Jacksonville and that if you're touring right. to come all the way down to Miami. It is a long drive. And so Well, it would be um, um it would be like we were so thrilled we had sonic youth come down and we would have let's see who else but it was like nobody wanted to come down because it was so far it was kind of like the not armpit of florida i think that's jacksonville yeah, it but it was so out of the way but yeah sonic youth remember the new york dolls Susie. um but yeah it was such a thrill it was such a thrill yeah there there was an event i want to talk about that happened yeah. in Gainesville called Slam Fest 83. So this was where Roach Motel, Rat Cafeteria, Hated Youth, Morbid Opera, and other bands have played. Do you have any memories of playing that? Because there were a lot of really great bands that played that show. I think I got up with Roach Motel and they did American Band. And um, I don't know who encouraged me, but I got up with Bob and he was kind of giving me dirty looks. But yeah, I wasn't into the hardcore more. It was kind of like just guys, you know, doing mosh pits and that. And I'm like, that's gross, man. But yeah, I think I remember that. I don't remember all the bands, but I know Roach Motel played. Right. Yeah. They and I'm glad played. you mentioned that because I forgot. <laughs> they definitely played. Well, well, personally, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, if that's the record that we have here, which are the bands you mentioned, but which is Roach Motel and Roach Motel and whatever. Maybe. Uh, personally, I remember going and I remember seeing Roach Motel and I remember Lisa like falling for the guitar player. But other than that, I don't remember shit. She, she met Jeff at, I yeah. think it was binders it's like you know the real no, we went, well we dropped then and the band traveled all the way to Gainesville to meet the guy because I remember we went all the way over there to meet him yeah but I remember Roach Motel played and it was this shitty old hotel in North Miami or Miami it could have been like Dania but you know when you think about real estate you're like man all these shithole hotels you wish you had the money to do something with but she she was like, oh, she made me go up and talk to him and give him her number. That's oh, yeah. right. I just remembered that. God, and man. yeah, and that was it. She might have said, "I that's going to be my husband. I can't remember. But she definitely had me um, go over and give her his number. And I'm like, oh, man, he's got long hair. But Jeff. Yeah, he did. Popular. He had long hair. Yeah, um, some some of the good bands in a uh, in the music scene. There was a lot of great bands. 
And it was a scene that, you know, got into and, the, and you know, the E, it was the reactions, um, you know, and uh, the weasels and broken talents and go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, the reactions. If anybody watched a Johnny Depp trial, Isaac Baruch was a guitar player for the reactions. And I'll never forget, they played at the Polish American Club. I don't know how they wrangled that, but Isaac peed on the floor, which, let me tell you, the elder, um, whoever was there serving sodas or whatever, they were not, they shut it down. And... Yeah, so he was funny as shit. But yeah, if you watch the um, Johnny Depp trial, Isaac was in that. But it was, back then, they were just a little bit older than me, but it was the reactions and the E. And have you heard of Smegma? Yeah. Oh, okay. And yeah, I was afraid of them, but it was like, wow. First time I saw Smegma, they played on a pool table at um, a bar in Miami. And yeah, it was like a little, you know, they were like really dangerous, but it, it, it was what I wanted to do. Right. And we but, would see them at, um, when we went to practice and recording, um, yeah, it was so impressive. It was so impressive. There was another band when you mentioned Tallahassee, who was on the We Can't Help It, We're From Florida compilation called Sector Four. Did you ever get a chance to play with them? Well, Maybe. I saw them on the record, but I'm I'm not sure about playing with them. Maybe I'll like say them. that if they were hardcore, I probably don't remember. Yeah. Hey, um, I what I do remember in the music scene, and I really got into. By you, I was in, still in high school on that, and I just started reading, which was really great about the music scene here that I got into, you know, like the fanzines, the fanzines. Nowadays, we have YouTube, we have whatever, social media, but the fanzines were the only thing that got us young kids that were alternative. You might have, nowadays, they might call us God. But then I had shaved my head. I don't know if, I don't know if, if, if uh, Libby did it because Libby did hair. <laughs> but I did actually have a mohawk. And I, sh I shaved my head and put safety pins and went to high school. And they actually got called into the class, called to the principal's office and told me, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you know, like, this is not acceptable. At the end, I dropped out of 10th grade. I was a dropout. And by 15, I was literally like a fucking corn dog, sexually active. I got into, I was just reading these magazines, like, what you zine? Know, what myself. zine, Carmen? What zine is that? I did all of them besides Maximum Rock and Roll. I have this one, Suburbia, and I saw this one, Bitch, Bitch from California. Uh, that was basically music, uh, women bands. Because that, after seeing Harden, I like women. And then I created this one with Allison and Katie Green, which was Savage Pink out of Philadelphia. But the point was that in the in the scene. You were either playing. I never called myself a musician. To me, a musician was somebody who knew what the fuck they were doing. Yeah, I liked to rock and roll. It was you. They were an artist, painting, or a writer, or like creative people. But I felt something when I used to look at these magazines, and something my mother taught me personally, because she was a single mother, and she said, you do what you want because you want to do it, not because you have to do it. Right. Carmen, let's go back to Suburban Relapse. Um, yeah. okay. Good That's friend, good. Um, Barry Saltz. He's uh -huh. more into uh, jazz now, but we were good friends and we went to California. We interviewed the Meat Puppets, but he was instrumental in getting um, Sonic Youth to Florida. And we would go to this bar called the I mean, after a big night out, this bar called D the Daiquiri. It was on Hollywood Boulevard. It was this dark bar and sit and think of ideas. I did some, um, wait, was it 
some illustrations for that one. There was another magazine called All right, I have to Kitchen Sink. Um, but I did some illustrations, but it would be like a um kind of a nineteen twenties, thirties, where everybody would congregate. It was dark. You would get pictures of screwdrivers for five bucks and just hang out and come up with ideas. But yeah, we interviewed the um, meat puppets now in um, California, Red Cross. Um, ah, let me think. Um, oh, whatever. We saw Nick Cave twice. And I think we were interviewed by Maximum Rock and Roll, but they were kind of assholes. So, I know, yeah. yeah. I, I know Maximum Rock and Roll did review Jesus Loves You, So Give Us Your Money. So how did they get a copy of the record? Um, probably Barry was, he produced or, you know, he was very instrumental in getting it out. And sending it out. That was Suburban Relapse was his um, record label. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. He was really As a cool. matter of He's fact, out. I think one of our records is on Suburban, no? The EP. Yeah. The Morbid the Morbid, Opera. Yeah. yeah. The Morbid Because Opera. this one, the compilation is on Destroy. So, yes. Right. Barry, um, I, we, we did hook up. I love him. Barry is still, now he does, which I love. Barry's now very into the, you know, um, I think Motown, it's like the 60s, but the, yeah, Motown, and I do follow him on Facebook. Um, I'll never forget we had our last gig, a gig, and they Morbid Opera made I I would say maybe it was a hundred eighty bucks or a hundred bucks, and they were so excited. It was in Miami, and they could come and go pick up the money, and I did. They'll never forgive me for this, and I did pick up the money. Lisa didn't forgive it to me after. But um, I didn't pay the band. I took the money and bought a one plane picture. <laughs> I don't even remember that. Yeah, oh, was... yeah. At least I fucking kicked my ass after that. They'll never forget it. That's I mean, you know what it is. I never took care of any of the finances. I just showed up to play drums. I did not that. All everything that was coordinated in the band, as far as the music, the writing, the effects, the records the shows was Libby and Lisa. That was them. They they were the band. That was them. I was just there. And um so some of the songs and the lyrics, if you really read about them, because then now I get to go back and read about them, they were like, you know, uh what would you say personal things in our lives or their lives, because I didn't write. And sometimes a little bit of politics and that. And when you read the interview, you get a little bit more insight. And Libby did like that psychedelic thing. You see that we have the mirages in our pictures because everything was in Libby's apartment and the lights and, and the, the psychedelic stuff. And that was what was great about them. Yeah. What did you I love being with them? It was like being with my sisters, you know, like they were <laughs> so cool and it was uh experience it was like yeah for me for me morbid opera was my which did come out after my spinal tap <laughs> nice that movie spinal tap, Hello, spinal tap. yeah you i want to get i want to get libby's thoughts on what her family thought of all this because it seems like a lot of this happened also where you lived so what did your parents think of what you were doing libby oh well they were fine um i used to listen to and i can't ever remember it was a station out of miami <clears throat> and they would w play wlrn like, maybe wlrn which yeah, is I think local, it was. and i think ted ted i got was name eric eric moss used to do wlrn that was the alternative college station okay but anyways, um, i'm yeah. sorry and I would, um, it would be like, turn it down because I would listen to it and play like buzzcocks, you know, turn it down. But uh, one mistake I made, <clears throat> we did an interview. Um, it was Tim Vaughn. He was a drummer at one point and I'm sure it was Lisa and, ah, well, Tim might've been the drummer then. But I just said all this stuff on the interview, just being like out there, like things that, uh, 
and my parents are like, um, I I don't know. I was like, yeah, I've had 15 abortion or just stupid stuff. Oh and my, my parents God, are like, really? what? I mean, just like saying outrageous things, trying to be outrageous. Right. And my parents are like, what? And I'm like, it was just really embarrassing. It really kind of humbled me on interviews. Um, Did any of your parents I, make it out to any of your gigs? No, my sister did, who is, um, we're night and day. We don't even talk anymore. And we played at like a community college in either Miami or Boca. <clears throat> and of course, she was not impressed because she's like, all I heard was Lisa saying, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> it was, was yeah, that it was, was she, yeah, we're night and day and it was, you know, I'm kind of the black sheep out of, you know, it's only two of us, but um, yeah, but my parents are, um, my dad was a writer and my mom <clears throat> Um, had our music degree so they were always they were always really um i don't know i just kind of did what i want sure i want to bring up a lisa quote because when i was listening to a lot of the music leading up to our episode and i've listened to a lot of this stuff prior to that but kind of listening to it even more so there's a live recording and at the end of one of the songs it's one of my favorite quotes and i'm going to quote lisa here uh, she says, if we can't lay in a little bit of puke, then what the fuck? <laughs> so okay. I'm going to have to find that quote. <laughs> okay, I can tell you the story. There was this club, I think on Dixie in, I want to say Fort Lauderdale. And we're playing, I mean, it was always bars that were about to go under. They're like, we'll yeah, try exactly. We don't give a shit. So we went to play and Carmen did acid and she threw up spaghetti and Lisa slipped in it. And I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm pretty uh, sure that's man. where it came from. Lisa was quick. Lisa. Um, I had an, my first apartment was off Los Olas paid three fifty a month. <clears throat> We'd stay oh my night. God. That is right. Cheap. <laughs> those, those, those days and Lisa <laughs> was in law school and she would crash yeah. and she was so she was so brilliant and she would go to law school and of course I'm like working some worker B job but she you know even though staying up all night could still go to law school like sleeping on, on yeah. the car, you know, or, or that, living room. That, that's, that's true. That, yeah. When Libby asked me to do this podcast and that and things like that, which if you read my interview, it was true. It was like, oh, and I obviously had other people like Katie Green and other people and like Kim March who gave me the flyer. And they always say like stories. Hey, do you remember that she was telling me there was a story like, oh, we went to a, we were playing in a club and, um, <laughs> and it was like I don't know if it was a gay club or something and Melissa Estridge actually walked in but she was a nobody my friend was really into her and she said oh yes and so then there, the crowd starts chanting like play disco Little Red Corvette I don't even know what the song is but my friend was like so excited she knew what the Corvette and and Lisa started actually singing it and uh, I, I never since I was self taught and I only know how to jam I did not what would you say? <laughs> we were being, um, what would you say? You know, chastised by the cows because they wanted to hear disco. And the thing was that I, I stormed off my friend who was actually the drummer. A drummer said, oh, I can play it. And Lisa was it. And then we just said, fuck this shit. And we threw everything down and stormed out. <laughs> because it was a disco club that wanted to hear disco music. So it was a gay bar and we I, were my friend I thought it was a gay bar but yeah, i don't know so I, I don't know if we were all girls we're thinking oh cool a girl band playing at a girl's gay bar like how cool and it was in miami beach hated us hated us it but they wanted to hear disco remember this was the 80s and that was the time of disco hip 
Uh, so basically, I'm gonna be honest. So my motto for playing music and being an independent person, the I was 16, 17, like six years in rock and roll. And Lisa, the singer, kind of followed along. And in we were like, everywhere we went, <laughs> we got into a lot of bar fights, even if it was after the band or even during shows. I was doing a show in, I think it was Flint. I will tell you right now, it was Finders Lounge. The owner was Shlomo. And... Because when being girls, some and we, you know, some girls would started heckling us, and they started heckling us where we're on stage. And I have a sister. My sister was a guitar player for me later, and the and then I, you know, whatever. And then the hecklers said, "Oh, like fuck your mother," and that's it. And everything went down. I mean, jumped off stage. My sister brass knuckles and beat the shit out of the people. Wow. And slow mo the owner was like, "What you doing?" But that's where was that went. just I, was that just you, Carmen, and your sister, or did other members of the band also? No, yeah, me and my fights? sister. Yeah, oh, me and my no. sister during a live. I want to get in jail. <laughs> during during a live show, yeah, I went to jail with another fight with Lisa at the New Wave Lounge that I mentioned to. You. Was that <laughs> the, the only time was, you had been arrested, or did you get arrested after that? No, I that was the first time with the band. I did with another band, but well, that whatever. That's okay. another story. Tripping <laughs> on acid at Disney World. Um, but the point was that me and Lisa would go out, you know, after band practice or whatever, and they'd also actually have a lot of fights in the streets because people would heckle us. And Lisa, I, I'm the type of person to walk away. Lisa did it. I had about four or five fucking bar fights big time. I'm talking about big time, but I had nothing to do with the band. And it was just something that, but we were family. We would go out, we would hang out with the crowd. And the crowd was uh, Dave Camp, who was the one who did our music uh, record. Also was married to, you know. Uh, so these people that I hanged out with, mind you, I was a minor. Yes, I keep pushing, I was a minor. And I'm grateful I found this crowd that let me push my energy out, this pent up energy out. By being with Morbid Opera and being with this crowd of the reactions, the E, the, the throbs, the furies, crank, all these people that were all musically or well inclined artists, uh, everything. And I mean, I, I'm sorry for the kids today that have, you know, social media, that uh, I, I, I try to show my granddaughter, like, look at me. And they're like, and I, they're like oh, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm like, well, I just am on fucking YouTube, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the crowds back then like the people that were oh. coming to some of these shows and maybe talk about that it was, and it, uh, the crowd then was us the same people it was the same people it was just us supporting us you know all the people katie allison lisa you know Johnny Salton, Debbie Rowe, the hate, Ray, Lori Lambert. I was all, you know, creamy like the Santa. We all showed up to the same place. It was like, where are you going to go for five bucks or two bucks? I mean, mind you, the shows were, but same people with the same state of mind, you know. Right. And um, what about when supporting, you played? What... Supporting each other. That's sure. what I felt. It was like, for me, it was a family. Sure. It was a family and adopted by a family. I mean, at that time, Miami was crazy. You had the cocaine cowboys. You had Grisel the Blonde Girl. You had all this fucking shit. You had the disco. And it was an alternative. And being a drop out of high school. And um, but, what were the and crowds like when you played? What about when you played some other areas? Like when you went to Tampa or you went to Gainesville? Oh, great. great. They were what? very, very, very... Um, what would you say? You know, open. I mean, it, what I'm trying to say, we were all kids or in college. There were, everybody was um, accepting. Everybody, everything, everything was great, you know, well, and everybody was good people. And, and everybody's home was open and we all saw each other. What's the matter? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was the place to be. For me, it was, it, it, pivoted me to the next level when I wanted to go because a lot of us did leave. You know, a lot of people thought, 
oh, you know, Miami's too far down. If you want to make it, you got to go to New York or LA. You know, that's the yeah, basically. And I actually did go with a group of folks from the scene. Uh, Morbid Opera did stay behind and Dave Kemp and I, and they continued going. And there is still a scene to this day, you know, in Florida. It, and it does exist. And I I basically got very delusional. When I went, I, I kept with the same shit, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, drugs run over, and that was the <laughs> end of my career. What was your experience so, like, Libby? Oh, so like New Wave Lounge, we, um, there were a lot of people who later were like, we looked up to you. And I had no idea. We became friends later um, where I had no idea. And like the Trash Monkeys. I remember there was a show or Broken Talent. I don't know if they're Broken Talent then. There was a hey, show at the Armory on, on um, 84. And I remember them playing and I went up and I'm like, oh my God, you were so cool. But then they were like in awe of us, which I had no idea, but it was, you were attracted to people of the same. And um, we ended up playing, I went on tour with Broken Talent um, to up to North Carolina. And do you remember Tammy Faye Baker by chance? Oh yes, I do. They, yeah. they had a Bible land. <clears throat> And we went to their, um, we had to do laundry. And <laughs> of course we got dirty looks. And when we were finally done, we got followed out of the city and we were ripping up a Bible and throwing it out the window, which, um, and we crossed state lines and they quit following us. But yeah, the Bible land or whatever it was called was kind of like Disney World for Christians. It was so much fun. Yeah. And Brian, have you ever was heard it, Brian? Was it, was it like one of those roadside attractions? No, no. It was, um, I think they had homes and okay. you can probably find it. I'm sure you can. Sure. Um, where it was kind of like a Disney World, like, you know, the fake right. facade and all that. But we had to do laundry and because we were on the road. Um, have you ever heard of Brian Douglas Clemens? The name he, he hung familiar. out with Gigi Allen. The name sounds familiar. Yeah. Gigi oh my Allen. God, I saw Gigi Allen and disgusting. Disgusting. I won. I didn't get hit by shit, but won. <laughs> I did I saw Gigi Allen and like Wow. Disgusting. Yeah. Like so he was on the it. he was on the tour with us which he wouldn't shut up. And I, I got into it with him, but it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And I talked to George and I don't remember, but we went to like an after hours um, diner. And he said, I kept asking the waitress for monkey bread. And I'm like, it, there's so many stories where somebody will go, remember that? And I'm like, no, but that's a fucking great story. Um, yeah, and Malcolm Tent, um, um, attributes me to playing like I was so bad on bass, I had a fuzz box to kind of blur it out. Um, it's cool, like it, 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 that you had influence because you were so bad, you didn't never thought you did, and yeah, um, played with um, trash monkeys, um in a garage where I lived. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool, but you never know who you influence. That's very and true. yeah, and yeah, I never, I just never thought about it, but. Was that the I'm first time, that, was that the first time you ever toured outside of Florida, Libby? Um, That was, I went on their tour. Right. I was like, hey, can I tag along? You know, because I forget how old I was and I wasn't working or whatever. And I loved them. And yeah, it was like sleeping on floors. And yeah, it was so much fun. But yeah, was, I was a little nervous. I was the prude. I was always afraid. I never got arrested. Um, but yeah. 
Did Morbid Opera ever play out of Florida? Um, I don't think so. No, I missed no. that when I was in the band. I will uh, no, not not when I was in the band. So I don't know about Libby. No, no, we did. No, we yeah, did. No, we didn't make it out. <laughs> I do but say we, we did play Finders Lounge. We played the Balkan Rock Club, which was on um, federal. We played Rock and Robin, which was Broward, because Libby and Lisa were from Broward. Nelson and I were from Miami. He was from Miami Lake Hills for the town. We did play Flynn's Lounge. We did play the New Wave Lounge. Yeah. And um, and uh, so. Well, you know what was cool at the ba the Balkan Lounge? I remember Halloween and the eat played and they all dressed like or maybe it was just eddie like castro mm -hmm. like they had the whole camouflage they were just like so cool but they were a little older so i was always in awe but anytime we could we would like play with them but yeah also one time i do remember playing with the eat at like i was mike and eddie peppy's o'brien's home that you know in the backyard because that was another thing that people used to do like play at people's homes and we did that i also remember specifically i remember this like yesterday and i think it was through to barry barry stalls from the suburban um fucking the bangles were in town the bangles that famous band the girl band it was the go-go's and the bangles and we were at a party and they bring them in and they i don't know they showed up at the after party but anyways, the Bengals show up. I, I don't know if you remember this, Libby, but I fucking yep. the drummer and says, this is Carmen, whatever. Okay, here I not into the Bengals, but anyways, they were famous with the walk up with like Egyptian. And what do you talk about? What is, the girls were not impressed because it was like a fucking, you know, local parties of fucking fuck ups. <laughs> Cigarettes at that at this time. No, and so they introduced me to the girl. And so what is that about like, hey yeah, what kind of drugs do you use? Like do you use Zildjian's? You know, and I was like, oh yeah, I don't know, fuck you and go on. But I actually was I remembered that Barry brought me and I was not impressed the the drummer of the Bangles, which is a blonde chick, if I'm correct. And introduced me to a fucking party. I don't know if you were there, uh, Libby, but I'm sure you were if I was there. Yeah, it was, I was off like, oh, this is Boulevard. I don't right? fucking remember, but I remember that. And I was like, what do you talk about? Oh, here's the drummer. And here's the other drummer from Morbid Opera. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> the Bangles. Yeah, I was surprised yeah, that uh, they actually showed up to the fucking party. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, hi, what? Symbols do you use? Sildjian's? Wow. Like, who tunes up your fucking drums? You know, I played with the Elf 7 and stuff. Like, I toured with, I, 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 not that I played with them. I, I, I opened up for them or whatever. And being a girl, and this was the great thing about being a girl and being, so my point of this conversation, like I said in the beginning, I got into music because I was not interested in being a groovy. I loved music. I loved heart. And when I got turned on to like, you know, the sex that like, you didn't have to really be talented to be a musician. And then I, I was into like the slits and whatever fucking girl band that existed. And I'm like, oh, I can do this. And now I don't have to pay an entry. And A, I'm in the stage and guess what? Free beer and it's fuck, fuck, fuck and sex, sex, sex and all the drug, 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 which it was. Besides that, you fucked every opening band. Yes, it was, or the headlining band. And I would say Libby was not there, but I would say me and another band member was. Um, it was, and I lived my motto, and it was. I was, I was into it. And I did live it up till like I was age 30. Then I, you then down. AIDS came <laughs> in in the 80s. So something else I want to get into that we kind of have danced around a little bit. And that's the actual recording and your experience with the seven inch EP that Morbid Opera put out, Jesus Loves You, So Give Us Your Money. Uh, one of my personal favorite records from Florida. So I want to start with you, Libby. And what do you remember about that seven inch record, your experience? Where was it recorded? Who was involved with it? What comes to mind? 
I'm thinking it was, and you mentioned because I forgot the first recording place. Um, Think Studios. Yes, yes, I believe it was there. I believe it was, it was there. Yeah, it was at yeah, Sting. yeah. And um, yeah, I remember driving to this um, warehouse where they printed it and picked it up, and yeah, it was. Yeah, that's what it was. I'm thinking way back, but. You know, it was like a warehouse. And I think our friend hooked, a friend of ours worked there and hooked us up because who knew? When you say uh, hook, when you say hooked you up, did he just did give you a good deal? Um, they worked the there. Deal? They worked yeah. there as far as, um, hey, that's what we do. Right. Because and it was like, you know, open bay warehouse. Because who knew? Well, from what I have that, uh, I don't remember recording the song, uh, the EP at all, but I do know that it was produced by David Camp and was recorded at Sync Studio. And okay. I do remember, and it was put out by Sabluck Record, that we had said fan mails, drugs, sexual toys, and large cash offers. What? But yeah, that's on our. Uh, I think. Oh, it's on there? On the insert. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, my whole thing of sex, drugs, and rock and roll still went down. But it was recorded by David Camp. And it was great. And David Camp is a head engineer now in uh, the Fillmore, which was formerly known as Jack and Gleason Theater. I will say that by playing all the clubs I ever played when I was a kid, uh, I love small venues. All the clubs I played, I love small venues. I like the cameo would be or the Jack Gleason Theater, now known as the Fillmore in South Beach, would be the biggest. I I don't like big arenas. I I can't stand big arenas. You know. Well, we and, would play but, Carmen. Remember, we would play at bars, and they were like on their last leg, whatever to bring in people, like these well, shitty yeah. little. And South South Beach was in the drug haven of the cocaine cowboys, and they were just fucking. Sh- I mean, I don't know how they really didn't get killed going there, but I mean, I I did laugh at that one interview you mentioned about me throwing up, and I remember that like yesterday, and I was doing probably drugs like Nat always did. Well, you had um, done acid and you forgot and, like and we rhythm. played and it was some strip place somewhere off A one A not A one A excuse me like for uh the old highway for 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 federal highway these people would yeah I don't know why these people would invite us and everybody started moshing everybody started moshing and you know um and we got moshed along with it and being wasted started to smash my drums apart and puked and yeah and i wonder why i don't wonder but i don't know why people i guess they were desperate they needed somebody to come into the club or people to spend money um would invite us to play and but it was exciting i mean i i i love it um there was very- another band there was another band that sublaps who put out the seven inch they put out also a gay cowboys and bondage record oh uh, what do you remember yeah. what do you remember that would be living. what do you remember yeah, would of, be living. Of, um, um, on sublaps lisa and i did an interview with them and they were like younger and we terrorized them but i mean not in a bad way because we were really cool on friends and I'm still friends with Milo on Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm still friends with all these people on Facebook. Um, but we like, there was one particular, um, Eddie was the bass player and we were asking him personal questions just because we were being jerks and make wanting to make them feel uncomfortable. Not Milo. I think it was Eddie. And, um, yeah, they were great. They were great. That's, I always wanted to bring people into our circle. You know, I want to play with you. I want to play with you. And I guess we were bigger. So they were like, really? But I just wanted, I always wanted to bring in people that 
I loved and yeah. And if the best record we have is the one that um Jeff Jeffrey did with Lisa, um, that remade remade the masters and could be bought and has a beautiful in in sleeve of you know the flyers and the interviews, right. the the four page interview that I was able to do with Sublabs, which really gave it, you know. I was gonna ask that question real quick, uh, Carmen and Libby. I want to ask that question because the seven inch was what came out at that time, but there were clearly more songs out there. Was there ever any talk back in the early mid eighties of doing a full length LP or was there something else that may have prohibited that from happening at that time? Um, I'm trying to think like Malcolm's cassette. I totally forgot about, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's things out there. I'm sure well, there's things out there. Um, well, Libby did send me a couple songs so that we could review for your podcast. Um, what I did find with Malcolm's cassette was, um, okay, a lot of it was, I, I didn't look at all of it. And I actually do have one. It was a lot of live, some of them were live shows. And I would say half of it because I was not always in Morbid Opera. I was introduced to Morbid Opera, maybe less than a year two. And after, there were drummers before me and there were drummers after me. So, um, and some of the, the little cassette, I'm not on there, you know, so I can't talk about that. And, but as far as the full length album that, um, Jeff did in, um, you know, in honor to his wife, Lisa, was, I do have to speak about Lisa. Lisa was a beautiful soul and was a really smart person and was very much morbid opera as Libby. Lisa and Libby were morbid opera and uh, really smart and witty. I mean, you have to, if you just read her interviews and yeah, that. Yeah, she was brilliant. I mean, she, she, she was yeah, a lawyer. She was brilliant. And, and, and the songs had to do with sometimes politics, sometimes had yeah, to do with personal experiences, wonderful. with the crap, but uh, she was on the money. Lisa was a big influence on me. Uh, and that's how I met Libby and really was a driving force in Morbid Opera. And, you know, sad to say she's not with us anymore. Uh, passed very young. And her husband, Jeff, from Roche Motel, re-released our, apparently, I guess they had the the masters of when we did the the, you know, the yeah, Jeff's excellent. And, nice. and, and they're actually much better recordings, uh, much better fine tune now with today. Mind you, that was the 80s with today's technology. So for me, the eight, the little, the little cassette tape, uh, which I am on some of the records, I'm not on all of them because I wasn't with the band forever. I only was in part time. I find the recording quality. I'm not going to fucking lie. I'm going to hear them all. I didn't like it. You know, like I'm more technical now. And I really did prefer if somebody really wanted to hear some more Morbid Opera stuff, I would recommend the the re, the re-release of the Morbid Opera album and and the 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 things we have here with sure. Roach Motel in them. Yeah. Those were the the original, the original right. OG. The cassette tape, to me, the cassette tapes were live recordings. I, I'm i not going to tell you I listened to them all, but sometimes where I recording at that time in the 80s, was I felt like, I don't know, it was more like a boombox being there. So um, it sounds a little bit noisy. So if you really want to capture it, it's better getting the EPs. And sure. I remember, I, I don't remember recording these, but I did remember because I do collect records like a 45. I thought, oh, a 45, one song on one side. Oh, no, the EP is the new thing. And the EP, you can fit 10 songs on one side. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't know. But, um, um, you know, I didn't have the gumption. And <laughs> get it, Carmen. Um, I didn't have the gumption. And Jeff is the one who put it out, saw it through. Um, he's always like, you know, these songs, and I'm like, whatever, Jeff, I got you. Well, I'm very, I, honestly, first of all, you have to have the masters. 
I myself have all the masters of the recordings I've done when I left Morbid Opera. I did not have, maybe Dave Camp had the masters and Jeff, uh, but I have the masters to the records I have done after I left Morbid Opera. And I have my bandmates asking me, hey, do you have this idea? And, you know, and I've been carrying them. It's been, what, we're talking about 40 fucking something years. And when Libby bit. asked me, I, I, I actually do have, and that's what you have to have. You have to have the masters <laughs> to sure. um, remaster a press for record. But, and I actually do have like six masters of things I've done after I did not have the original Morbid Opera. Like I said, Morbid Opera is Lisa and Libby. And it's great that they I'm, existed though, those masters, because I've talked to many people through many of the different episodes that I've done. And there's a lot of people who, the masters got ruined or they got lost or they got water damaged. So it's a really wonderful thing that you had those masters to put out that record. To be able to, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, go ahead, Libby. Oh, Dave yes. Camp. I remember recording in his living group, like his parents, of course. Or, you know what oh, I mean? Oh, yes. I was in his parents' um, house. Recording and it was all real to real. Wow. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the now, master's well, Dave Camp also worked with two other local bands from South Florida. And maybe you can share your thoughts if you had any sure. connections with these bands. The first one was F. Did you ever have F, any? Yeah. They F. were out of West Palm. I think they were more hardcore, which once again, I always associate hardcore with boys or, you know, like mosh pits and that. And that wasn't my thing. Um, he also was in a band called Crank. Yeah, with it, his wife before. Why? Well, Crank played a lot. Of, Crank played a lot of shows at Flynn's as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, Flynn's. That's where I saw him. And then he also well, Crank, worked with. Yeah. I was going to say, Camp right. also worked with the Menstrual Cycles. Did you have any connections with them? Yes. Um, yes. Mario, I believe. Yes. Right. Well, Dave, oh, really? I knew him from the beginning. And um, Dave was in every single band. It was always something, part of something. Um, Roy and the Hayheads. I have pictures of him and Roy and the Hayheads, which was, you know, I know Johnny Salton was in it, which was from Charlie Pickett. Violet uh, Love Denise and the Rowe, Dead Her brother James Rowe and... Um, uh, the Cheka guy and Lori Lambert and um, so they lived. They lived. I think in Miami Shores at that. We were kids. Uh, I, I I I I ended up traveling with Dave Camp. I might maybe with maybe a morbid opera, but I remember there were times. Very beautiful person. Uh, one time, I you know we were out. We were like wasted, wasted. You know, like, and, and going into his parents' house, he always dragged us into his parents' house. And he wouldn't let me let us drive home. This is like, and and, and he literally this sat in the car. I went to drop him off in his car, at my car or our car, whatever the fuck I was with. It was just Polly Kim, and just like you're not driving home, and sat there with us for hours till we <laughs> sobered up. So I also remember one time driving home with Lisa and Jeff. I had my own car. I lived in Kendall. Whatever, we were probably partying. And they said, they come to my house. And we were driving home. And mind you, Kendall was, but fuck you, Jeff. I was driving, Jeff and Lisa, Jeff from Roche Motel, Lisa, the lead singer of the Lord Opera, are driving behind me. And I go off the road, up in the medium, and just start flying down the medium. <laughs> Lisa's freaking out. Baby, I actually woke up before the medium broke into like a cement thing. <laughs> That sounds like fun, Carmen. <laughs> Lisa was hysterical. I was like, oh, my God. And I remember, like, you know. So, yes, I know Jeff. Jeff and Lisa, we really had some fucking weird ass times. And Dave Camp. And Dave Camp was there from day one um, in the scene. And, like, the reactions, which was Joy Maya. Uh, he married my friend, my best friend. Um, Joy Maya, which I think you should interview, is great. He just put a book out, um, and it was talking about the scene and the reactions. 
at that time, everybody thought their reactions was going to be the thing. You know, when you were you had asked Libby earlier, oh, what did your parents think about you're doing your music thing? Well, what my parents thought, I think my mom maybe went to one show. I don't know. But my family <laughs> thought <laughs> that I wasn't shit if I wasn't Gloria Estefan. <laughs> But that, that, the that sets was, the bar. I was doing that it sets the bar really because high. I loved it. You know, I didn't give a fuck. She didn't get it. Like they didn't get it. You know, like I do this because it was like a release of energy. Yeah. And it was like, you know, like that was it. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And it was just a party time. And partying was it. Being in the scene and and being with friends that were good people, artists. And that, uh, and playing all these clubs and playing with all these artists, and I, I didn't call them musicians. It would never, would, I would never call myself a musician because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing then. Uh, L Libby was very talented, very, very like artistic, and that's what brought Morbid Opera together. And and basically, it was like a couple of misfits that didn't know how to play but wanted to be in the scene and wanted to be heard and wanted to be part of something. And we were accepted in the scene. Everybody came to see us. And I mean, and, and my actual friend actually kept this flyer 45 fucking years later, sent it to me before this interview and said, look, Carmen, what I got. And I'm like, what the fuck would you hold on to that for? And then I find out that this was actually the first uh, gig I ever did with Margaret Opera. And what uh, better than to eat? Because Chris Cotty taught me how to play drums. And I, mean, I was hugging out with Chris Cotty. I went to their award show. Uh, the Eat actually got an award. That I was wearing suit and ties. I will never forget. And, you know, since we were living with them, I went to the award show. There was an award show in Florida for a band. And the Eat actually won it. Well, the, the, and, eat, the Eat was yeah. like the pinnacle. That was like you know, the, the communist radio, the, the communist radio band you could yeah. play with. Yeah, and and Barry Stocks actually, if I that I will be honest with you, I have a copy of everybody's record. You know, from Broken Talent, I have the reactions. Nice. I have Charlie Pickett, and I have I like Jenna Torture. When I came back, they Jenna were Tor after me. But, but the point was that where's, I don't where's your, have one. Where's your, I, where's your communist radio? Eat radio. I don't have it. And that's David the one that's got to be in the safety yeah, deposit box. David sold right, his right, right. thousand dollars. Barry, Barry can, actually gave him a thousand dollars. I have to interview Eddie, and I'm after we get off this, I'm yeah, you have to him talk on Eddie. Facebook. He should have a copy. And but his wife know. was his wife was in Smegma short, you know, for a brief time. Right. Yeah, I'd um, love to. I'd er, love to er, uh, Eric uh, Moss. Eric Moss was also big down. He was in W. I think it was WLRN. Eric did, Moss. Did was you a both? Big thing. Did, you, did you both know Bob Slade? The name sounds familiar. Yeah. The name sounds familiar. He, he had yeah. he, he had his he was radio a promoter. Show. And it, right, and he had his radio show off the beaten path on WLRN. Oh, okay, that was yeah, pretty yeah. influential. So, uh, and, well, I know yeah. Eric Moss was on WLRN, and then we oh. had Ted and uh, Ted and Leslie Wimmer um, from Open Books. Open Books. Open and books. Records. What are your memories right. of Open was, Books? Because they were pretty. Huh? They were they were pretty influential because of. Oh, absolutely! Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. well, I remember a show. That uh, yeah. it was in the afternoon. I think it was the eat and maybe the reactions. I know I skipped school to go to it, but Leslie's on Facebook. I mean, oh my God, you should. I'm going to give you a list and contact them. Um, you should really interview these people. Yeah, I, I, I would love to have them on. And you might have also perhaps been reached out to i don't know i can't remember off the top of my head but uh when joey seaman and chris potash put out their book recently punk under the sun south florida punk and new wave in the 80s uh, i believe yeah. i know morbid opera is in the book so it is. Really? i didn't know i did see your podcast on it i didn't get all through it but, but it's i mean I, okay, I'm not gonna lie. I I kind of just I did scroll your stuff. Um, 
but it seemed to be it was like after 1980 something so honestly i wasn't here with morbid opera yeah but yes i did see some stuff uh i i kind of briefed it the um I was in the scene probably from 1979, 15 years old, till 1982. The book definitely covers, they get into right. the late 70s. Even though the book is primarily about okay. the 80s, they do mention a lot of the bands who were kind of wrapping oh, up I, I, from, oh, the, from oh, well, that transition. It's going to be a definite from, buy for me. From the 70s Like, Joe, like into, Joey's... Uh, Drummer of Miami Beach, think, several pages. I think with Punk Under uh, the Sun, what you'd like about that book is not just the written text, but the photographs that they were able to oh, well, so tap I, into. I, I'm gonna, I'm there's gonna a, definitely buy it. Then I will buy it if you recommend it. I'm gonna buy it. There's a lot of great uh, photography I, in I, there. I, 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 think I, I bought, it. I bought Joey's because I knew Joey and from Miami, from the reactions. And we also moved to New York together. You know, he lived in New York. I lived in New York. And I actually ended up buying the my drum set from Joey, from one he toured with the battalion, which is the drum set I have to this day. Right, and it's still sitting here 25 fucking years mm -hmm. later. And, sure. <laughs> you sure. know, uh, yeah. so I bought Joey's book because it was a personal thing. Okay, yeah. But I do know many people have been putting out a lot of books from an yeah. agnostic front, from the New yeah. York hardcore. This was the people... first, as, as far as I know, this was the first uh -huh. book that really documented in that kind of way what was happening in South Florida at that time, which uh -huh. was a long time coming because to your point, Carmen, a lot of these other scenes have had books coming out for years, but nothing really out there around South Florida. One of the other uh -huh. bands that was also featured a bit in the book that perhaps you may have been familiar with because they had a female singer, the Screaming Sneakers. Did you ever get a chance to see them or play uh -huh. with them at all? I fucking love them. And they went to New York when I went to New York. They did go to New York. And yeah. Gary Sunshine is still putting stuff out to this day. He has a, uh, uh, yes, Lisa, are you talking about Lisa Nash? Lisa Nash, yeah. Yes. Was she, did she, Did any of the Screaming Sneakers members, were they coming to Morbid Opera shows as far as you knew? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Gary Sunshine was there. And uh, I think, I mean, Robert I Mascara. Remember yeah, no. Robert? Yeah, he'd come okay. to our shows for sure. Well, we, I, I would say in the end, wherever we played or whoever we were there, if anybody like made a snarky ass comment, you went down. What was the what was the worst injury you ever had, Carmen, at one of the gigs? Whether you were in attendance as a as a fan or whether you were playing a show, did you have any really bad injuries at any point? No, the only uh, the only injury I di I did have one. Uh, you know, everybody was into moshing then, the mosh pit and that, and I don't know where I was in a club, and I you know, and we were moshing around, which was Lori Lambert and the Hayheads, and that we were fucking around. We were women. We were girls. I mean, I'm talking about we're like 17 years old. You know what I mean? Right. And some idiot fucking guy just decided to dive on me. And as I was getting off the floor, front, and I have a herniated disc. That was the only injury I ever had. Wow. And to this day, I'm suffering at 60 years old. Yeah, that's I can't lift my motorcycle off the floor. That's a significant and, yeah, injury. Yeah, I can't lift my motor because and and you know what? I would say a lot of people I know do have a lot of injuries from that, from the mosh pit. Yeah. I do not enter the mosh pit and will not enter the mosh pit, but the mosh pit was something that was very aggressive and people sure. do get hurt. I want to ask, I, I want to ask Libby yeah. that same question. So Libby, uh, we were talking about perhaps any injuries you got, whether it be you were just in the crowd or you're playing a show, did anything ever happen to where maybe you, 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 you did get hurt at some point? No, I the mosh pit, but it was just guys shirtless, you know, making contact, and I, I, I just went into the hardcore thing. Yeah. Well, that was me in the mosh pit. We got fucked up, but anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, I believe you were. You would be in the mosh pit. You're a firecracker lady. <laughs> now, what about yeah, I, what about uh, what about like Lisa? You know, was she? 
more of on the side kind of watching when she was going to shows or was she in the pit? Yeah, like- she would get in the mosh pit. She would get in the mosh pit. And she loved hardcore. Um, yeah. No, she- Lisa was in it. She was, she made it. She was in it deeper than I was. She was the leader I followed. Uh, Lisa um was a very smart, intelligent woman and didn't back down from men's comments um, or things if she saw something sexist. Yeah, she was very political. Whatever. I mean, yeah. and she was very political and she, you know, she, yeah, you couldn't fucking put she, her. Did, did Lisa ever share with either of you what her opinions were of the band later on? Did she have any opinions of the legacy of Morbid Opera? Did anything like that ever come about in just conversations you had with her as the years went on well she was with jeff so i mean it was always um great i mean you know it's it was we were always intertwined lisa my personal opinion on her i mean one thing and you also see it in the interview with sublabs always had a smile on her face i mean she fucking laughed in guilds of everything she was had a great laugh yeah she had a great laugh i mean i never saw her angry or upset or sad she didn't let those things hold her back um she was a driving force in morbid opera as libby was libby and lisa were the driving force yeah we started the band right you know they were the band they were the band and everybody after i left played with them Charlie Pickett, Michael Bryan from The Eat. Uh, yeah. Rick, uh, you know, everybody wanted to play and didn't have a problem um, filling in for them. So that goes to show you how Lisa's personality was, that it was really cool. And Lisa's music, when I read it now, you know, now, now I read the lyrics, my favorite song was the one, which one thing with our band was, you know, uh, I couldn't, ch- I did actually play one song on vocals and I sucked. I, I really found it very terrifying uh, being a lead singer or anything like that in the front. Uh, Libby sang a song. Libby and uh, Lisa would switch instruments. Lisa would play guitar. Lisa would play bass. Uh, and if Jeff was there, and Lee, and Libby became the singer and and did the song Sledgehammer, which a lot of my friends really like, which we were well, talking we would about. Mix it up, yeah. yeah. And then um, there are there are two songs. Just I want to go back to that for a quick minute because I think there's two songs, and I believe Libby, you may have written both of these songs. These are my, two of my personal favorites: uh, Private Prostitute uh-huh. and Madness. And female trouble is a close third. So, which is another song, but I didn't know if it would be struck. But Sir Robert from Creamy Electric Santa recommended that as coming into the podcast. Oh yeah, and, um, yeah. You know, it was all about teen angst. You know, I painted my room black. I was all about that stuff. Right. I mean, not that stuff, like not satanic, but it was, you know, teen angst and depression. And yeah. Were you writing a lot of these songs just alone or were you with other people like other friends or, or Lisa? Or... No, I would write them alone. I, I a lot of times it would be, you know, um, I can sing it, but I can't write it. And I'm like, no problem. I had no problem writing things and yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, teen angst. I don't know how else to explain sure. it. When you were playing a lot of the shows as we were kind of unpacking a little earlier, I wanted mm-hmm. to ask who perhaps was helping with getting Morbid Opera on some of those shows at some of these different places? Do you remember who some of those oh, people were? Oh, we would like search out. We would search out like dive bars, um, 
and friends would find places. Um, yeah, I was always doing the flyers. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, I'm sure it was friends like suggesting or knowing, but, um, so like Flynn's, for example, how did you get booked at Flynn's? Um, I'm sure it was. Um, well, maybe I can other tell you, Harvard I... Opera didn't have a manager. <laughs> I kind of figured that. The manager yeah. was Libby and Lisa. Yeah, and it was um, being proactive and having no fear and contacting places. And um, yeah, yeah. Just... So you also have to know that we were very good friends with the E, Charlie Pickett, because they were also our band members. Right. The E, the Chris Cotty, Tommy had to play drums. And so we were very intertwined with these people. Everybody and... wanted to help out each other. Exactly. So in the sense, I mean, I don't know. The band manager was Libby and Elizabeth. And Lisa, there was no like a band manager that you book. Like in New York, they all have to send a cassette tape and book a tape with Hilly Crystal. No, that wasn't it. And so if you were part of the group or the friends group, you got booked because if they said, because I mean, how yeah, else would Morbid Opera get booked with the Eid and Cruz and all these fucking people unless they knew us? And they said, oh yeah, cool, whatever, put them in the, put them on the bill. And um, at that time, that first gig I did with the band which was a really big bill, which was Crucial Truth. Um, and that was out of Mitchell and them. And, they, and in U.S. Furious, was the, I guess the band that came after the reactions. Right. And The Eat and Charlie Pickett. I mean, those were the biggest bands at that time, you know, like that actually had possible record deals and moved on and, and being part of them all because you know we were the girls and they knew us and knew whatever and it was very and we fortunate. would ask or whatever yeah, yeah they, let, they let us on the bill <laughs> there's a, there's another venue that hasn't come up yet that is truly the cbgbs of of furry south florida and that was churchill's oh yeah what are your memories of playing churchill's in that time period Oh, I remember. Okay. So, um, the owner of Churchill's was very, he was an English guy. Did you ever go to Churchill's? I did, but it was way later. Dave Daniels and his house was connected. And I'm not sure, um, how I really don't know how we got connected. But um, yeah, it was. Were you always... going to shows there at all? Like, did you were you seeing oh, bands? Oh, absolutely, play at their shows? absolutely. Um, it was like when you went to a show, even like way back, Flynn's New Wave. It was coming to your family. Um, my family was very cool, supportive, but it wasn't this warm thing. And I remember like. Barry Saltz was a hugger. And I remember he would come up and hug. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, it was, everybody was so, um, so welcoming and friends. And we were all oddballs. And I would stay at Barry's on the couch. He would bring chicks home. Um, but, you know, we were platonic friends. We would go to, um, wait, Flynn's. And then since I lived in Fort Lauderdale, I would crash on his couch. Did you it know, was... did you know Richard Shelter who was also promoting shows? Yeah. Yeah. What, what are your... I what... went to Richard Shelter's. Uh, I, I was trying to actually find the shirt to put on, but I did, which was the rock and roll, the last rock and roll show he did that he just promoted a couple of years ago. Uh, and that's where I saw Lisa's, uh, Lisa, the lead singer of Morbid Opera's husband, yeah, Lisa had passed away and gave me a copy of the album that he had promoted. Uh, I had seen Libby at, at, uh, at uh, maybe might have not been that same day, but I did see Libby. Yes, when I came back and I, I came back to Miami in 93, Churchill's was the place to go and I saw a lot of bands 
And I saw, we saw Lydia lunch. I have pictures of Lisa. Yeah, that's the last Lydia time lunch. we saw each other. I do know that I was there when Richard Shelton did his promotion. I think it was 2017. The he didn't punk really rock, like us. Pop rock reform. He didn't, he didn't like um, Morbid Opera? No. Yeah. Uh, he I, was I, a great promoter. I, uh, I hate to say anything, but he didn't really like us. Um, myself and the trash monkeys were kind of outsiders and critical of, but um I uh, you know he put Flynn's together and uh, yeah he put Flynn's together did you but ever yes, no. did, did you ever ahead. play any did you ever play or go to shows at some of the other places he was putting on like at the Blitz um, I'm sure we did. I'm sure we did because being in the band and being in the scene, we went to all the shows. And yes, I I I met I you know I, at that time, um like I said um you know there was Slomo of Finders Lounge. I didn't know the people's name. There was you know Scott the Jew was at, at every all our shows, and oh, then there was God. Richard Stelter. Uh, there were there was characters and um but I did finally meet Richard uh at like you know the, that had the, which everybody was there, which was like Lisa's husband from Roach Motel, uh Joy Maya from all the people that I knew from that era of the eighties were there and I think the thing was twenty seventeen, which was like the punk rock reunion. Right. That was a true uh, show. Unfortunately unfortunately people like to eat and then, you know, because weren't there but it was great i loved it it was so, great I so you both you both went carmen and libby both went I to that went. I, I, went. Went. I flew down from north carolina and um i think carmen and i touched base on facebook and she and her sister gina were there and it was great i had a bad experience with somebody i was staying with but carmen was fantastic was there ever any um, was there ever any talk about perhaps doing some kind of reunion of the remaining members of Morbid Opera? I would do you it. Know, of course, I would have to re I would have to have a lot of practice. I I, but, I personally uh, what okay, from my personal opinion, when I I I left Morbid Opera by probably 1982 and then they they continued and maybe another and i went to new york and then i returned to miami in 1993 and i quit i never played again i when i came back a lot of the people from like uh, that that group of people we knew asked me to play but you know i thought my i thought it was so higher than anything i didn't play and i haven't played ever again i knew i was playing since i was 15 years old and I got burnt out. Never, I would never say never, but it's not the same. Yeah. So from what your recollection is, Libby, as far mm -hmm. as you can remember, there are no other songs that remain unreleased. Everything was put out, whether it be on um, that compilation or on the one that Malcolm Tent put out. With You uh, know, I mentioned label. that, but then I don't know. There might be. And, um, like the Malcolm stuff, I don't remember doing that. Um, but we also recorded with this guy named Rory, who's on Facebook, um, which I'm going to refresh Jeff's memory, um, about like, if he has our oral reach out to Rory myself, um, to see if he has anything, yeah. but, um, yeah, there are some songs with eddie i mean with mike o'brien for sure did, and he was like fantastic he was a genius when jeff put out that uh compilation that came out a few years uh -huh. ago did anyone from the band make any money off of that i did initially um but i was always like jeff you know he'd be like i'm gonna do this and i'm like jeff do whatever you want, you know, because he was the one who made it happen. Right. Um, you know, do your thing. Yeah. 
I personally did not. Jeff asked me and Libby asked me, and I personally did not request anything because this was a, uh, for me, <laughs> you know, it was a memory in time in my life. And no, I'm, I mean, personally, I never made a fucking dime playing with Morbid Opera. And less do I expect to make a dime after that. And if anybody's really interested in it, great. You know, I would never. And if Jeff put his time, money, and effort, everything right, should go exactly. to him. Yeah. And it's not, never, you know, I mean, uh, uh, no, I never, I said I was not interested in anything. Because but, that's just the way it is. We did it for the love of it. I did it. I did music because I love to jam. And it's very beautiful that there's actually, you know, that this guy did this, you know, put this release, this remix with David Camp as a uh, thing, which sounds great. And um, that, that he puts it out and someone like yourself is actually interested in this because this is a time of my life that was a pinnacle time of my life of that, you know, yeah. made me who I am today and just kind of was a blur, to be honest. And someone such as yourself would actually be interested in, well, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> and it was hard to say, well, I don't know what happened because it was a I blur. Think, but <laughs> yes. If, I think there are a lot of people out there. You do, uh, if, uh, if you're interested, well, yeah. this is what happened. Life, life was beautiful then. Uh, I was a young kid, you know, lost and music made it for me and made me grow to who I was as far as I didn't know how to play drums, but I, I actually got better with time. More of an offer gave me the opportunity and the scene, they accepted me and it's something, and I grew, I grew and actually, you know, I used to play to the Ramones, which I have on my poster and in, in in the end, I actually played with Joy Ramone. I was with Joy Ramone in the Spiky Tops. The guy was a fucking weirdo. But anyways, Dee Dee Ramone, not excuse me, not Joy Ramone. Dee Dee Ramone. I was I gonna say maybe you meant. I was yeah. gonna say maybe you meant Dee Dee and not Jen, and not Joy. Yeah, Dee Dee Ramone and the Spiky Tops. Actually, has a record out in New Rochelle. Uh, I did, I, and actually on YouTube, I I did Dee Dee. I got to play with, I actually, uh, my friend in New York was banging Christine. I, man, he was 40, we were 20. You mentioned I too, real to, quick, Carmen, you mentioned Mariah to us recording that Chris huh? Stein is the one who gave you your name, Carmen. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So my buddy um, who was in my band was my bass player. When I left Morbid Opera, I started a band. My sister called, I did a band in New York. PMS, Premetal Syndrome, which was a punk band. I remember that. Uh, and I ended up taking Elizabeth, which is from Orbit Opera with me. She ended up joining me up there. Because Libby, you did Pill Magnet, right? After right, Orbit Opera. Right. What was that? But, uh, you know what I wanted to say? If Jeff organized a Morbid Opera show, I would be just in it. You know, just Oh, I would be there because... too. I mean, I would love it. I mean, I, yeah. I have no, I have no qualms if there was ever yeah. such a show. I'm like a team player, but uh, I, I, I am. But, so, but anyhow, I, find it, ahead, I, find, I find it hard, not with Lisa, because Lisa was a big part of, you know, the fucking, I don't know, the person and Libby, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, they're a halt and all. <laughs> Simon and Goldfunker. Where do you go from there? But yes, I would do it. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem. But um, I, 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 uh, I, I don't know who would be the singer because Lisa, which out of all this conversation that we've had on this show about Morbid Opera, was really a big part of the personality and of who was Morbid Opera, and it was a driving factor. And um, I could not express in words the, um, you know, the, oh, what you say? Uh, you know, the thing that it has done to my life. And I don't want to cry now because being of Lisa is just like, you know, um, you know, impact on my life as a person who I am today. It is a very big person in the morbid opera thing. 
and you can't not think of morbid opera and nobody in the scene can't think of morbid opera without thinking of lisa and libby and you know i mean to me it's you know uh, herman I, I i i i i find it difficult when libby asked me to do it and i was just like oh my god it's like a big thing in my life um but really uh and and it, Lisa was an empowered woman that didn't take shit from anybody and showed me that. <laughs> but you know that's why we had a lot of bar fights. You know, I always thought like Ari out from the slits passed away. I think the same year, and Pauline Pauline Styrene from the X Ray Specs passed away. And I always like to think of Lisa. You know. What a collaboration, or what a, I don't know, you know, you never know what's up there or whatever. Right. And I always try to think of happy thoughts, happy thoughts. I mean, I was devastated when she, when she passed, but um, yeah, I, I try to think of she's up there with good people. Well, she's up there looking us down now and thinking, oh, my God, I'm great that Libby and Carmen got together again, you know, yeah, because yeah. I really was not close to Libby. I was much closer to um, Lisa. Yeah, we touched and, base. And um, I'm years pretty ago. sure she's looking down now and saying, yo, bitch, it's about time. And and like I said, the band was Lisa and Libby. They were the driving force. And everybody who everybody and anybody wanted to play with them. And regardless, like I said, I wanted to play with them. Um, you had the Charlie Pickett, you had the the O'Briens, which were from the E. You had Jeff before, you know, from Roach Motel. So it was a band that everybody helped sit in and play with. So they pulled a uh, uh, broken talent, whatever. They pulled everybody pulled their, so the 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 these women must have been special in a sense that they touched you that you actually wanted to you know go and jam with them you know what i mean right. and oh, we that's were... something i i can't i can't explain it i can't but they were and there was a very beautiful tribute about lisa and many people put a lot of tributes about lisa because it was she was a person she touched a lot and yeah she was a very political and at the same time, and then she became a judge or a uh, or whatever, or well, a, she whatever a she did with the court. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah and, and you have to laugh about it. <laughs> well, I think, too, <laughs> um, it was always about being humble. It was never yes. being, never having um, better than the, better than people. You know, it was always welcoming and yeah. I've always tried yeah. to be humble. And Lisa and Libby were like that. They they accepted everybody. And yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would say that Lisa was a really big part and impacted my personal life. And, um, you know, a, it's sad. She's gone and very young. And, and that's one thing I noticed. And I was talking about Libby that, you know, I mean, I'm okay. I've been in the music business. And with and also famous artists, and I'm I'm very surprised, and I'm not gonna lie that yeah, you know, I would say about I would say about a good 30, 40 percent are dead already, have passed away. It could be cancer, it could be overdose. Like Elizabeth, the Elizabeth that I brought into the band, and her family was you know OD in New York City and things like that, you know. And I'm surprised that it's like, oh my God, uh, honestly, I'm 60 years old. I just turned 60 five months ago and I'm not waiting to wait for retirement age because I figured, oh my God, all my friends are passed away and I prefer <laughs> starting to fucking I, I know that uh, I was trying to get to this before too a little bit because I know that Libby, you did pill magnets and that was kind of a different era, right? That was the era of places like Squeeze, which I remember going to. We played with Boy. bands such as the Livid Kittens, who I've had Paige Harvey on the podcast uh, before as well. So, Do you remember Logan the Bartender? No, I, I wasn't. No, that's all, my husband yeah, now. I did not I, know um, I adopted my daughter from China and um, and then I met my, well, I met my husband while my papers were in China. 
and we've been married for 26 years. Wow. But um, yeah, we played it squeeze. So it was kind of like friends getting together. I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. We'll play. And um, yeah, that What's was that really fun time. Was that the last time that you played in a band like that? Yeah. Yeah. I have like five guitars and an amp and I haven't played, you know, and I'm an art. Well, I hate saying artist, but it's, I haven't um, painted, you know, it's like these things and yeah. So, but yeah, I love pill magnet. Yeah. I love the songs. Um, I don't have you heard them at all? I, I have. Heard I have, and I know that there was a live recording that Rat Bastard had done that I've been trying to track down, and it's kind of hard. Maybe if I reach yeah. out to him, maybe he can supply a copy. Uh, but it's hard. Some of that stuff is hard to find. There was a, I think, a tape uh, that the band put out, and it's it's not that easily found. But uh, I have heard it before, though. I I think it might be on band camp i had a falling out with uh the bass player which we were friends forever um but hmm, yeah i'm not sure you know i forget like who recorded us i know rap bastard did which right. was funny that's why i brought up the um sync studios because when we first started out he was like ah shit and then he ended up um recording us Right. And he's like all about the avant garde and everything. Yeah. Which I hope he doesn't um uh get mad at me or whatever. Um, but I definitely have and I'll share them with you. That would if be I wonderful. can, you know, I haven't looked it up. That would be but wonderful. you know, I, yeah. I keep thinking about like buying a, a four track to but you know, I don't know. As we get older, it's right. like you want to, and sure. then you. I completely I mean, agree. The further I progress. feel like, the further things start to become in the rearview mirror, the less and less you're likely to turn the car around and go back to see. Well, where is yeah. it? Yeah, and I know I could still come up with good songs. You know, sure. if P. J. Harvey could do it, I can do it. There but. Well, oh, shit, maybe let's get together and do something. I guess we could these days. I am know? down. I'm okay. ready. I'm retired. You still have your drum set? Oh, fuck yeah. I got my drum set for Joey Meyer, the reactions, when he played with the Battalion of Saints. And I just dusted them off. I, I have to put new heads on it. I bought me a new bass because now, now that I'm retired and I actually have time, you kind of go back, and that was the only thing that gave me um, comfort and tranquility. And I now that I live in Southwest Florida, which my sister said that's the place where you go to die. Uh, basically, I'm alone. Uh, so I'm making a she shed man cave, which all my things will be going up. Alone, you're bass, married to and your I wife. have a keyboard, and I have a fucking drum set, and and I I basically <laughs> hit YouTube and jam out to myself. But, I will say though, real quick, if if anything does happen where there's some reunion of any kind, or there's morbid opera songs that live again in that way, uh, please keep us posted. Uh, let us know oh, if, sure. that, if that does happen. Uh, I know anything could happen. Uh, I'm a firm believer. I, ne I, never, I know for never a say fact never. that there, I know for a fact that there were two morbid opera songs. That at the time I wrote and Elizabeth before uh, we when we left um, Morbid Opera and we went to New York, but these songs were in writing, which was something in the cellar. Elizabeth wrote that, which actually came out of a thing, and unfortunately, and I wrote Unemployment, which is kind of like Lisa's thing of Eat the Rich. I. I started writing after I left Morbid Opera. And, you know, and so these songs really were supposed to be a Morbid Opera. Um, and I will say something. My friend Elizabeth Brocklin, who passed away, um, was a great guitarist, beautiful woman, and was in Morbid Opera and played with us. And 
Well, it was really sad. And I don't, I'm not really sure if she's on any of the recordings of Morbid Opera. I can't tell you that. And it was a shame. She followed me to New York and I had an album and she was not on the album. And then she ended up quitting and then went with another band who put an album. And the point was my best friend here from my from Morbid Opera and Elizabeth, which was one of the players, um, she was a great player. She played with Charlie Pink and that. Everybody used this poor woman <laughs> and she was never on a recording. This is what kills me that I, I will say, because, you know, they, they thought, oh, she's a great, I'm going to take her. And they used her and never made her put part of the albums. And it's really sad to say because she was really talented, you know, like us, you know, semi-talented sure. well, or whatever. Uh, Carmen, let me stop and, you. I think she was um, on some of the um, live recordings. Um, she might have been because I did see that and I love to hear it because, but it was very sad that when we left New York, Miami to New York, she wasn't. She never got, she made a neighbor to my album and she then never made it to the second album. And anyway, she passed of an OD. Um, and it's sad that this woman played with us. She played with me from Morbid Off all the way to the fucking end and made it with everybody up in here. And never, because me personally, I'm going to be honest, I don't give a fuck about the shows I ever played because I couldn't remember it. <laughs> But I, what I like about my age now at 60 and even at 30 or 40, that I have the records, I have on my rec records and all the videos and like the things I recorded. I And I can go to YouTube and I can see myself from fucking age 8, 15 to age 30. And I love it. And the only thing that mattered was recording. Recording, forget about the live things. Yeah, the live things were fun. Yeah, you can talk about it. And if you can remember it. And most of our friends tell me, oh, this would happen to you. <laughs> that would but having the recording, that to me was the something that I could, you know, like say, okay, this happened. Sure. You know I mean, it cemented so, the legacy of exactly. the band. Exactly. So it cemented what sure. that was. Absolutely. So I, I've been playing since the age of 16 to age 30. And the only thing I do have to show for that are the, you know, either the demos or the records. And, and I, I mean, in New York, I actually have live videos. But anyways, sure. um, that, that was it. You know, like the recording. Recording in the studio is, is the more satisfying thing ever than playing a live show. Yeah. And I, I think... And I, I opened up for the E. Yeah. And I think, too... When it comes to the contributions that the two of you and the other members had made of Morbid Opera, I think it's pretty clear that there's a legacy of Morbid Opera. There are other bands. There's other people I've had on the podcast who have brought up Morbid Opera. The band left their mark on a variety of people, whether you may know it or not, from who you've talked well, to over the years. It's well, I don't know it, but thank you for saying yeah. it. <laughs> and and I know that a lot of people will be very excited to check this episode out because of the contributions and in many ways the music that Morbid Opera was making back then helped to shift a lot of music later on of bands that sounded a little like Morbid Opera, but it had to have come somewhere else first, whether they listen to morbid opera at that point or not morbid opera was ahead of their time and it's really wonderful to have you both on to tell the story of the band uh and it's a, it's unfortunate you know that lisa passed and she wasn't here to share hers hers her perspective as well however you both brought to light a lot of what you knew and what her memory was of the band and thank you for that and also anyone else who was in the band over the years it just really wonderful to have you on uh to take the time out to talk about your memories of well thank you Morbid so Opera. much jeff i really enjoyed this um thank you jeff for having us and to speak of this part of our life 
And uh, and again, it's just been so wonderful having you both on to tell the story of Morbid Opera. I'm going to give each of you the opportunity to kind of share any final last words before we wrap things up today. Uh, Libby, I can kind of start with you. Anything you want to share to kind of close things out? Floor is yours. Uh, it was just that time was collaborative and it was a wonderful time and everybody was so helpful and it was so new and you know Florida didn't, didn't have that stuff there was smegma um but there was nothing out there like that I mean there were lots of bands but um you know I don't know if we ever had completely girls but it was so different and it was so fun. And I met so many wonderful people that are still family. You know, closer than family. It was like my new family. I guess Thank that's you. it. Thank you, Libby. And Carmen, what about well, you? Uh, for me, um, being in Morbid Opera was a really life exchanging experience in my life as and my sexuality as a human or whatever, uh, uh, being, you know, and made me who I am today. I have no regrets. Uh, I love it. I love playing music. And I was very grateful that Libby and Lisa allowed me to, you know, just be me and play like a fucking, fucking crack addict <laughs> and enjoyed and and I just loved it. I loved it, and it propelled me to the next level of my musical career, if if you want to call that. Um, and when I left Miami, and and eventually I did come back, and Miami is my home, and the Miami scene is the Miami scene, and we're here, and um, I loved it that they gave me the opportunity of who I am today and allowed me to be in my my artistic thing and that was due to lisa and libby who gave me that opportunity and being um you know accepted by the community of the punk rock crowd like david camp and the eat and everybody that came across and gave me you know my skills that i did have today that also moved on to my you know whatever, when I have to work. <laughs> I will say I have no regrets. I've never regretted my past and will never do it. And, you know, and I, I live by it. And I'm very, I love it. I love, and I thank you very much um, for the opportunity to let me ex um, express this and, and hooking me up with Libby again. <laughs> You know, after yeah, all these you, years, you know, I I appreciate it because we were not in contact for many years. And um, I appreciate it because it did bring a lot up that, you know, you tend to forget, you know. And um, I'm very fortunate. And something told me in my life, they're my records. They're my, the only records I ever had was with Marvin Opera. That's where I started. And in the end, that was it. It, was, if it wasn't for them. And the Miami music scene, I wouldn't be who I was today and and, and accomplish what I did accomplish in my life in the after that. So I thank you and um, you know, wish you the best. Thank you, Jeff. I'll be in touch. Thank you both. 